in Peter Sloterdijk's trilogy Spheres in the second edition called Globes, he first introduces us to his theory of immunology. Before we go into a more complicated study of this idea of immunology, of which we'll take more than one video, it's probably important to lay down some kind of theoretical groundwork. In the first edition of Slaughter Dyke's trilogy, he introduces us to a alternative understanding of human ontology, alternative from the typical sort of individualized essence or individualized being this we currently have as a framework. And he introduces us to an idea um, of biune, which would be an understanding of ourselves as something which is between two separate points. Human self-understanding begins with a sort of in utero sense of being, because of course we are also biologically starting out in that point. But this individuation process, which humans go through, is, according to Sloterdijk, a lot different to how uh, most understandings of the self, understandings of an individual would posit. Human individuation isn't, according to Sloterdijk, uh, the product simply of being, an, simply of by essence being an individual, but moving from a microsphere to a macrosphere. The intimate microsphere um, being of which we start with, which is, I think, most obvious in mother-child relations, in utero relations, but generally can be translated to small, intimate um, social spaces, families, couples. The macrosphere, on the other hand, are things which we can understand as larger social spheres, culture, the state, and so forth. The theory of immunology is basically a theory of culture, insofar as the deposits culture within a spatial understanding of human ontology. We first come across Sloterdijk's description of the move from the bubble, the microsphere, to the globe, the macrosphere, in, in the second edition of his trilogy, Globes. And the theory of this movement is basically an immunization which facilitates human beings to be able to cope and to be able to endure the loss of those who live within our microsphere, within our intimate bubble space. This is at least the first step, the kind of, we could maybe call it the primordial step of how collectives, shared identities, cooperative human relations beyond just immediate biological kin first form. Sloterdijk writes, quote, expansions only take place if previously external elements can be absorbed by the smaller sphere and reinterpreted as factors of its tensile force and super elevated curvature. To consider this plausible, one would have to warm to the idea that spheres are adaptive constructs, as it were practicing immune systems and containers with growing walls. As the idea of immunology, even in the biological sense, would suggest there's a disruption, a threat, a trauma, a loss to a sort of intimate space, which then has to overcome that loss or that destruction, um, endure and adapt. He continues and says, even the simple reproduction of living spheres can never succeed without a primary reparative intelligence. Humans always live in the danger of being separated from those who are closest to them by violence and death. And in the early small human worlds, those left behind have always faced the problem of finding a way to go on living without their most important augmenters. 
The human space comes about through injection with death. If humans do not possess the frightening and admirable ability to come to terms with the deaths of their nearest, and if they were unable to fill or cover up the gap left by vanished, sorry, left by those who have vanished with substitutes, no individual could ever die alone. People would never go ahead into death unaccompanied, for the death of the irreplaceable one would always be the death of the allied other too. Sloterdijk uses the kind of literary motif called Liebestad, which refers to the separation of two lovers um, through death. For example, Tristan and Isolde, um, of which he he uh, says, Isolde outlives Tristan by 80 years. And also he uses James Cameron's film, The Titanic, in which you see the separation of two lovers, one of them living on for a significant period of time after the other one. I would also add that there's another kind of motif which is common in cinema and in film and in Shakespearean plays, which is the death of a father figure leaving a son behind, which is normally an ethical duty to live on um, a kind of traumatic intrusion into a small space with an immediate protector and then suddenly that's destroyed and you have a um, ethical duty once the father is dead to live on normally with the goal of revenge as well but whether it's the separation of lovers or the separation of a parent from a child it's normally um, the immune system emerges with the ethical duty to live on slaughterdike also posits a theory of the ego which is very um, interesting. He says, quote, the most significant individualization depends on rehearsing abandonment by one's nearest, just as culture can only succeed if it works as a preparation for living on after the death of the masters. This is normally discussed in terms of a legacy, which assenuates the positive handing over. One could equally view it from the perspective of being abandoned and say that the one left behind is damned to take over. The ego comes, ab uh, comes about not through an illusory mirroring, as Lacan seductively and wrongly taught. It first assumes a self-referential shape through the anticipation of being orphaned and widowed and posits itself as deserted and deserting. The ego is an organ of pre-abandonment and pre-farewell. Because the ego-forming expectation of abandonment is of an essentially anticipatory nature, it protects those who have braced themselves for being left alone someday from irreparable separation disasters. This implies the ego has uh, the ability to immunize itself from the impact of that disaster. And I'll admit that I'm only less than a quarter of a way through Globe, so perhaps I'm preemptively... Uh, thinking what he's what uh, Slaughterdike is going to explain, but as Slaughterdike being quite Nietzschean, there's also a theme um, which I think is important of Nietzsche's declaration that God is dead and God is certainly part of the macrosphere and not the microsphere. But nonetheless, um, the historical turmoil of of uh, spheres of protection and the destruction of them and the creation of them certainly is relatable to the ego in many ways given that Nietzsche's declaration God is dead also happened to be part of a larger system of thought from Nietzsche which psychologically emphasized the ego a lot and was extremely critical of attempts to dismiss devalue the ego for example the Christian injunction towards um, unconditional compassion and forgiveness and so forth. Slaughterdike's theory of immunology seems to stress the ability to move something um, from the outside, from the external, from the unknowable, from the monstrous, into the inside, into something which can be lived with and endured by way of 
a sort of spatial movement. He says, microspheres grow into macrospheres to the extent that they manage to incorporate the stressful external forces into their own radius. One could thus describe the growth of spheres as a stress course during which external elements are neutralized by being included in the spheric interior. It is mostly proto-political stressors like enemies and strangers, socio-psychological stressors like collective depressions, and mental stressors like the monstrous and the idea of the infinite that have been integrated before a small ethnospheric unit can develop into a higher level world form. A group that had withdrawn all significant monsters inwards and, in a sense, overcome or enclosed them, would have grown into the empire or advanced civ uh, civilized macrosphere. I was reminded here when I thought about this, um, and Slaughter like is trying to posit an understanding of why some cultures are successful and why others are not successful, and what do we mean by successful? Um, I was reminded of the success of Greek civilization and the uh, kind of motivation of someone like Alexander the Great. And if you think about Alexander the Great in terms of the monstrous, in terms of the outside and the inside, he was basically confronting every single externality he could find. And he was basically moving towards, and this isn't Slaughterdike saying this, I'm just kind of drawing this conclusion um, and drawing this connection myself. But Alexander the Great was a figure of kind of cultural um, extremity in a sense, that he was confronting the outside constantly and 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 uh, trying to trying to integrate that externality and that outside into an inside and of course one of the main motivations was to overcome the fear of death the the this idea of eternal eternal renowned throughout time in it, within the heroic um, psychology and understanding is always about being able to being able to endure the uh, the kind of monstrous overwhelming um, pressure of eternity, and of course it is eternity which uh, overwhelms us because we're mortal and because people die, we die, and people we know die. Um, the a successful culture will be able to sort of integrate the loss of the inside into something uh, or not necessarily totally outside but but into a larger spheric realm uh, Slaughterdike says remembering the dead necessarily initiates sphere creating processes as a psychological sphere rent opened by the disappearance of the important other the intimate bubble of coexistence can only be restored through a form of sp space creating immune reaction. It is impossible to repair the closest intimate space without expanding it. If the survivors insist on remaining together with the departed in a certain sense, this can only occur if the dead are located as if in a second ring around the sphere of the living. Slaughterdike tries to understand this within the Christian and platonic, um, understanding he says the platonic ascent from the ephemeral sensible to the everlasting super sensible and the christian killing of death are already typical operations to create macrospheres large interiors of spiritualized vitality that successfully oppose the attacks of the outside the basic operation of the christian work of mourning lies in replacing the lost partner in closeness with the partner in long distance closeness the living god Whoever does not wish to live on as an abandoned half must find a new augmenter. And, uh, and wherever metaphysical needs intervene in this difficulty, the augmentation will be of a spiritualizing, transcending, and superlative nature. As in the Platonic school of love, the inner twin must first present itself as a beautiful individual, then as, a, as the beautiful as such, and finally as the over-beautiful, over-good God.